Sensory memory is the short time to review the massive amounts of sensory input we receive. Most of this information is discarded and this begins the process of encoding. What were the four objects I just showed you? I don't remember. Oh, hi there. Let's talk about encoding. Encoding is the crucial first step in creating a new memory. Basically, it's the process of turning your sensory perceptions into information to be stored in the brain. There are several ways this can occur, including visual and acoustic encoding. I'm here at the library to uh, see just exactly how does encoding look. Let's take a look. All right, now stay quiet. We're gonna see if we can find an example of encoding. Just wait for me. the distance there. I don't know if you can see it, but he is encoding. <laughs> now he's not encoding. Short-term memory is a phase or type of memory responsible for the temporary storage of information. Stop following me, okay? What are you talking about? You're showing me which way the boat went. A boat? Hey! I've seen a boat that passed by not too long ago. It, it went, um, this way. It went this way. Follow me. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is going on? You already told me which way the boat was going. I did? Oh, uh, no. If this is some kind of practical joke, it's not funny. And I know funny. I'm a clownfish. No, it's not. I know it's not. But I'm, I'm so sorry. See, I, I suffer from short-term memory loss. Short-term? For my video project, I decided to perform an experiment on my three siblings to demonstrate the concept of deep processing. I began by preparing two lists of words using a random word generator, each list consisting of ten words. When I read the first list to my siblings, I asked them to think of the number of syllables in each word, which is shallow processing. When I read the second list, I asked them to think about what each word means to them and whether it has a positive or negative connotation, which is deep processing. After repeating each list of them twice, they wrote down all the words that they could remember. The results are listed here. There were more remembrances of words from the second list than the first, because when it was read to my siblings, they were relating the words to information they already had stored. This demonstrates the concept of deep processing. Deep processing is a type of encoding where you form associations between new information and information already stored. My siblings remembered more words from the second list because they were encoding using deep processing, which made the information being encoded more meaningful. All right, all I gotta do is remember some numbers for this quiz. How hard could it be? Oh God. All right, so this threes. Um, oh wait, if I group them in fours, I don't have to remember each individual number. I can remember it like that. All right, I think I'm ready. The first four. Uh, Three, six, four, eight. The second four was nine, two, one, eight. Yeah. By chunking them in groups of four, it's easy to remember. Let's go. The serial position effect is our tendency to recall best the first and the last items in a list. We remember the early words in a list because we have time to rehearse each word in our heads. We remember the last words in a list due to the recency effect. Okay, I'm going to list 10 numbers and you're going to recall them to me in order, okay? Okay. All right. 1, 7, 6, 8, 3, 2, 9, 4, 2, 5. 1, 7, 6, 8, 3, 9, 4, 2, 5. As you can see, my sister recalled the numbers that I begun with and the numbers at the end, but forgot and even eliminated some numbers in the middle. Memory is processed through three fundamental processing stages, storage, encoding, and retrieval. Storing refers to the process of placing newly acquired information into memory, which is modified in the brain for easier storage. An example of storage would be how I store my pencils in this here mug. Super handy.
Did you know that Scotland has 421 words for snow? Episodic memory is a type of long-term memory which requires explicit recall, which means you are consciously thinking. This includes memories of personally experienced events, such as remembering your first grade field trip to the zoo. Hey, did you know it's illegal to own more than one guinea pig in Switzerland? Did you know it's illegal to own more than one guinea pig in Switzerland? Whoa. <laughs> Procedural memory is part of the long-term memory that is responsible for knowing how to do things. Also known as... Some examples of procedural memory are walking, talking, and tying your shoes. <laughs> I can never remember my password. Hint, what's your mother's maiden name? Oh, the bell. Recall is information retrieved from earlier knowledge. Brooke, who was the 44th president? Um, Barack Obama. Recognition is the process that matches information from a stimulus with information retrieved from the memory. Allie, who is the main character in Hannah Montana? Miley Cyrus. Bella, who is the main male character in High School Musical? Zac Efron. Who is the main surfer character in Chasing Mavericks? Johnny Weston. Priming is the activation, often unconsciously, of certain associations, thus predisposing one's perception or memory to a certain response. So essentially your brain has a bunch of things to keep track of, so it forms associations in order to recall them more easily. For example, when prompted with the word yellow and asked to name a fruit, your brain would recall yellow fruits faster than other ones because it takes more brain activity to recall unrelated stimuli. Essentially, it would take advantage of these connections it has already made to the word yellow in order to recall information faster. State-dependent memory is the principle that remembering something is easier if you're in the same state of consciousness or same state of mind as you were when you learned the information. For example, if I chewed this mint gum and listened to this music as I studied for a test, it would be easier to remember that information while taking the test because my brain has made a connection between the mint gum or the music and the information. Hmm. Why do I feel like I've read this book before? Memory construction is filling in a gap in that specific memory every time you retrieve it. You can simplify it, emphasize, or change a few details. An example of this would be the telephone game we always played it as kids. She starts off as saying, my favorite color is yellow and change to her least favorite color is yellow. The misinformation effect refers to the remembrance of prior information inferring with the memory of the original event. An example of this is getting in a car accident and remember there being a yield sign instead of a stop sign. Oh my gosh, Michael Cohen completes first stage of intricate plan to break incarcerated brother out of prison from inside. Did you hear about that crazy news story? No, what was it about? Michael Cohen's gonna break his brother out of prison from inside. Oh my gosh, where did you read that? I read it on CNN.com, so it must be true. What? There's nothing about Michael Cohen trying to break his brother out of prison. She must have read this somewhere else. I tried looking at that story you told me about on CNN.com, but it wasn't there. Are you sure? I know I read it on CNN. Yes, I'm sure. Maybe you should check your browser history. Okay. What? www.fakenews.com? Sarah, you've been having a lot of memory issues lately. Hey, Sarah, I think you might have source amnesia. What's source amnesia? Read this. Source amnesia is attributing information to the wrong source. Forgetting means failing to remember. For example, you tell your parents that you will take the trash out, but you are watching the football game. Right as the play ends, you forget to take the trash out. Because you are focusing on the game more than taking the trash out, you forget the task because you were distracted.
Selective attention means that we focus on one thing over another and therefore do not remember that one thing. For example, in class, a teacher is giving a lecture. While they are giving that lecture, you are on your Chromebook playing Tetris. Because you are focusing on the Tetris game more than the lecture, you only end up encoding and storing small bits of the information from the lecture in your memory. Proactive interference is when new information is disrupted by old information. Each year, teachers have to learn new names. An example of proactive interference would be them calling you by the name of a student they had the previous year. Another example of proactive interference would be if you got a new number and someone asks for your number, you end up giving some digits of your previous phone number.